Thanks for being here. And thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Jim. The, uh, I wasn't planning to talk too much about uh, Unilever, if you don't mind. Uh, he said enough already about it, so that's probably where it stops. But uh, flying in and, uh, this morning to, uh, to come here, I had to take an early plane. And I was sitting there at the uh, airport in uh, Los Angeles, and I overheard three people talking. And I know it's very impolite to listen to people talking at an airport, but I know you all do, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not ashamed to share the story with you. But I quickly discovered that I was an engineer, an economist, and a doctor. And they were bragging, and the doctor said, hey, we have the, I have the oldest profession in the world. And uh, the other said, why is this? He said, well, you go to the book of Genesis. Uh, you know, uh, Eve came out of the ribs of Adam and both, or Adam came out of the ribs of Eve or whoever, both of them survived. Uh, that was the first successful operation. Doctors have the oldest profession. And the engineer said, I don't think so, because when there was chaos, we created the universe. And to make order out of chaos, you have to be an engineer. So engineers have the oldest profession. And the economist said, I don't think so, because who created chaos in the first place? <laughs> and um, I think that describes a little bit what I want to talk about today, who created chaos in the first place. But before I do that, let me um, first tell you how uh, pleased I am to be here in this uh, Konrad von Gugelberg Memorial Lecture. We were just talking with uh, some of the kind uh, people who have known him and studied with him in the class of uh, 87. But he seemed to have been a remarkable person and, and frankly a little bit ahead of his time. As I said then, I would love to have meet, met him, but it's certainly an honor to be part of uh, his life indirectly by recognizing him. And doing that in a school like Stanford, obviously, is a wonderful opportunity. You have a great institution here. Undoubtedly, I'll call my mother today and tell her I was at Stanford, and she'll be very proud. <laughs> but um, you, uh, you also have a very progressive, and we were talking that uh, vision towards what the role of uh, the uh, education should be and the people that you are producing here for tomorrow's world. You've been very instrumental, as Jim said, to work on the uh, high carbon stock issues around uh, for deforestation, et cetera. And if we don't have the academic world actively involved, I don't think we can solve so many of the world's problems. And uh, we had a chance this morning with a tremendous group of professors and faculty and PhD students and others to talk a little bit about the challenges of palm oil in the supply chain, which are not all that obvious. And to think about that together, the more you talk about it, means that uh, these issues are solvable, but we all need to contribute our own individual parts to this. And uh, as a university, I think more than ever, showing your leadership in the area of sustainability will place you very well. Because the future issues that we need to solve are obviously the challenges of climate and energy or water or biodiversity or natural capital and many of the other things. The um, students that are here, I think the, uh, the, the skill sets that we need to learn to be successful in life undoubtedly Many of them are going to be the same as we've always had. We need hardworking people, a certain level of intelligence, integrity. All these things are not going to change. But increasingly, we need to have some other skill sets to be successful in this world. And clearly, many people struggle with that. Otherwise, I believe we would have solved already some of the challenges that are out there. But to be a good business person, you need to know as much in the future, in my opinion, about sustainability as you know about sales. So you need to know as much about climate change as you do about cash flow. Or you need to know as much about international development as you do about business development. It really requires a broader vision if you want to manage these challenges that um, we know we, we are seeing every day in this world. The first thing to start on a little bit of a positive note, I think it's actually uh, a great time to be here. If you look at the last 15 years, uh, the world has actually come quite a long way. Uh, we've uh, seen the uh, effects of globalization actually benefiting many people, as we can see that the spread of some of these ideals of democracy or the opportunities that it offered by getting an in increasingly integrated uh, global economy and an interdependent world has undoubtedly lifted many people out of poverty. In fact, in the last few decades, more people have been lifted out of poverty than any time in human history. More people are going to school any time in human history. More people have access to clean drinking water or sanitation. And yes, it's also true that more 
uh, women are actually uh, participating in the global economy than ever. In fact, the original goals that we set in 2000 for the global agenda, which were called the Millennial Development Goals, had as a simple objective to halve the number of people living in poverty over the 15-year period, from the year 2000 to 2015. And in fact, we have achieved that. We have achieved that, and we should be proud about that. This is a healthier uh, and wealthier world than at any time. And, um, but at the same time, I have to take a step back a little bit after these 15 years. And um, it reminds me a little bit of Dickens, who wrote in the 1850s his book, uh, 1870s, uh, The Tale of Two Cities. At that time, he was talking about Paris and London. I'm spending most of my time in London. But uh, his book starts with, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I think we're a little bit in that situation right now. Whilst we've lifted enormous amounts of people out of poverty, we also have still uh, challenges that need to be solved. And many of these challenges, actually, I think we became fully aware of that in the crisis in 2007, 2008. Some people said it's a financial crisis, then some people said it's a governmental crisis, then it became economic crisis, and we're still recuperating from that. In fact, it was the worst crisis on record since the Great Depression in the 20s. And uh, I think it made us realize, I've always found, by the way, that this is, was more of a crisis of morality than anything else. But it made us realize that the system we had created had certainly lifted so many people out of poverty, but it wasn't quite sustainable. Uh, it came at an enormous cost, a high level of private or, or government debt, an enormous level of overconsumption, and frankly, leaving too many people behind. I've, I've always said that in any system where too many people feel that they're not participating or are being left behind, that system will ultimately rebel against itself, just like a cancer in a body. And you've seen that happen, actually, increasingly so. The question is, have we learned anything since this crisis? I hope the answer would be affirmative, but if you look at the hard numbers, you have to really ask yourself questions. The debt that caused this crisis, by the way, an economic system that was very much around, uh, we asked the Saudis to pump the oil, we asked the Chinese to produce the plastic, and we asked the Americans to consume. That's basically what we were doing in a very simplistic way. And um, you'd think we would have learned from that now that we are eight years further or nine years further, but the global debt actually has gone up by another 57 trillion. That's 40% more global debt. Obviously, quantitative easing and all these things have played a role for it, basically in Europe and the US. Companies, actually, you see uh, the same behavior, very little investment in the future of companies, more being given back on special dividends and share buybacks on the financial side because of this abundance of capital, but very limited amounts of money are entering in the real economy. You look at overconsumption, I think we're still on this linear consumption path. Only 10% of the packaging, for example, gets reused. 90% ends up in landfills and unfortunately more and more in the oceans. And that's not going to last either. So on the consumption pattern, we still haven't moved to a circular consumption pattern at the speed that is required. In fact, you take the top 1.2 billion people in this world that, to which we all belong, believe it or not, but the top 1.2 billion people consume 75% of the world's resources. And the bottom 1 billion, only 1%. But I can assure you, if you're on the bottom, you all aspire to live like us. And the numbers just don't add up anymore. We're living way beyond the limits of our planetary boundaries, and climate change obviously is one of the effects that we see. And then you think we left too many people behind. Well, we're again a little bit further, and, and frankly, in the next, the eight years since the crisis, the Gini coefficient in all countries in the world has actually gone up. The only country that is an exception, I believe, is Ecuador by memory, but the rest, we've actually increased the gap. There are now 62 people in this world that have the same net wealth as the bottom 95%. In fact, the top 1% in the world, has, uh, sorry, the bottom 3.5 billion, the top 1% in the world has the same wealth as the bottom 99%. We've created, really, a system that is not sustainable, but we've not certainly not made it better. And one of the key uh, effects that you see from this is uh, climate change. In fact, the World Bank, Jim Kim, estimates that uh, if we, we've, as you know, we've just passed the one degree towards the two degrees, which is about the maximum that everybody sort of thinks that this world can handle before the consequences become dear 
Uh, lots of people are starting to talk now about one and a half degrees. In fact, scientists are finding out with the bleaching of the coral reefs, for example, that one in, well, above one and a half degrees, the coral reefs are gone. Scientifically now basically well established. And uh, if that happens, you'd put the livelihood of about a billion people at risk again. But interestingly, uh, Jim Kim uh, from the World Bank issued a report fairly recently that if we stay on the current trajectory, then about 100 million more people will fall into poverty. Climate change, as I've said many times, is actually a human development agenda. It's the poor that suffer. When you had Hurricane Sandy or other things in the US, I have sons living in New York. They had a great time climbing the stairs. They didn't have to go to the gym. They saw some people a little bit more than they were watching television. But in the end of the day, within a few weeks, you were back with the resilience you've built up. But the people in Haiti and others, they were pushed back another few years. Climate change is a development agenda issue more than anything else. Um, 14 of the last 15 years have been the warmest on record. Uh, California has not been excluded from this. I think uh, Jerry Brown has been a fairly outspoken governor in this state and the water shortages that you have and the extensions of the limitations of water you can use as a good example of that. In fact, the IMF estimates that the real cost of ch climate change to the global economy already today, if you include everything, which is air pollution, you know, in China, 1.8 million people a year lose their lives of... Uh, lose their lives to air pollution. But you count all the externalities in there, they're estimating that that is about $5.3 trillion already now in, in costs of actually not acting. I was just looking at the London School of Economics, I guess one of your competitors to some extent, that said that uh, climate change, actually the economic losses could go to about $27 trillion. Uh, dollars. That's about 20% of the world's assets. That's quite a lot. And the Sustainable Accounting Standard Board said, in fact, if you look in the U.S., 93% of the U.S. equities would actually be at risk because of climate change. And it's not just the financial side of that. WWF was calculating that in the last, uh, since the 70s, we have about uh, lost about 50% of our uh, mammals, reptiles, or birds, so it's a question a little bit of when is it our turn, in my opinion, if we don't take any actions without being a doomsday scenario. I was reading a book on, from uh, Hubert Reeves, who is a uh, Canadian philosopher, and Hubert Reeves uh, said something that stuck to me when I read this. He said, man is the most insane species. He worships an invisible God and destroys a visible nature, not realizing that the visible nature he destroys is the invisible God he worships. And that is about what we are doing right now, and that's obviously not a pathway that is sustainable. So I was very glad to see 2015 hopefully being a watershed year, because in 2015, two historic things happened. First of all, the signing of the Sustainable Development Goals in September at the UN, which are the, the follow-up from the Millennial Development Goals covering the next 15 years, where 193 countries in the world went together and said, for the next 15 years, we have an opportunity to irreversibly eradicate poverty, irreversibly eradicate poverty in a more sustainable and equitable way. Out of that came 17 goals. Goal number one, obviously, poverty alleviation. Goal number two, food security. Goal number five, gender equality. Goal number six, water sanitation. Goal number 16, governments. Goal number 17, partnerships. 16 goals that if we would work all these goals, we could indeed do that. And the first test of these Sustainable Development Goals came in December last year in Paris with the famous COP21. The COP21, where all the countries in the world, again, about 190 countries, submitted their intended nationally determined commitments, what they thought they could do to stem the tide of climate change. We were on a four degree trajectory and lo and behold, in Paris with the agreement, we've actually bent that curve. The agreement covers all countries, four times more than the Kyoto Protocol, and it was on a voluntary basis. You propose, just adding up what was proposed. No backsliding, cannot go back, five-year review, $100 billion a year financing to move forward, obviously, and help the poor countries. A pretty good agreement as a starting point. Obviously, we've discovered that we cannot wait till the end of the century to tackle climate change, and now we have to work on accelerating it, but the base has been laid. So I'm actually very pleased that for the first time in history, we could be 
be the generation, if you want to, and especially the young people here, that uh, solve poverty, which is a noble goal to go for by itself, but also ensure that future generations don't have to deal anymore with the effects of climate change. I was very pleased a few weeks ago in New York where I was present when 175 member state countries actually ratified the Paris Agreement. We need 55% of the countries, 55% of the carbon emission to make that go into law. But interesting to see the US right now, uh, the Chinese and some others are actually trying to push this agenda forward uh, to ensure a more rapid implementation. Now this agenda, which is an enormous agenda for humanity, zero poverty, zero carbon emission. I don't think any business person would set such an audacious goal for his own business. And certainly not if you tell him or her that it's in the next 15 years, more or less, that the thing needs to happen. So we won't get there if we don't work all together. And business has an enormous role to play, which is the only thing really I want to leave you with, that more businesses need to start taking a higher level of responsibility to be part of that solution. After all, there is no business case in enduring poverty. I've discovered that a long time ago. Even in our company, which is fortunate enough to be in 190 countries or reach 2 billion consumers a day, we have to be sure that this is a more inclusive uh, society. An interesting statistic not to bother you is that, but the world spends 9.7 trillion a year on violence and war preventions and spendings on actually having these things. 9.7 trillion. If we would just take that money, which is three times higher than the development agenda I'm talking about, we could wipe out all the debt in the emerging markets with that. And we could give some, le level, some of the money still that is left to Europe to start stabilizing their European uh, monetary system if we wanted to. This is just a little plea from my home base so that we get a little bit for this. But this is what we are currently doing. This world has become reactive and spends behind the symptoms of the, the results instead of attacking the cause. You see the same in other areas, by the way. Healthcare is a good example, where you have an enormous epidemic uh, coming up of uh, diabetes 2 with obesity, and we end up spending all the money treating it instead of going to prevention. This is very much what we're doing in the global economy as well. Now, you won't solve this development agenda if you don't get business involved. It's very simple. The development agenda, as I mentioned, costs about two to three trillion dollars a year, which, by the way, is a pimple on a global economy of 100 to 110 trillion dollars. It's actually a shame that we have to talk that or knock on people's doors. And as we know, there's enough money that is going around. We just have to put it to better use. But the overseas development aid from all the governments in the world has come down now to about 160 billion dollars. And the pressure is more downwards than upwards with all these these uh, attempts to reduce these government deficits. So you need to use that relatively small amount of money to unlock the private sector financing to make this development agenda come alive. Now, another statistic that would show you why the private sector should be involved is because if you look in basically the emerging markets, which will be 80% of the world population very soon, you'll have the private sector be 60% of the GDP about 80% of the financial flow and 90% of the job creation. So if you don't involve the private sector, it's very hard to see how you can actually then solve these things. And then the bigger companies have to be obviously even more so involved. The top 1,000 companies in this world have actually about 50% of the world market cap. And not only that, they actually have uh, it, if done in terms of revenues. You're talking about $35 trillion. So if you don't get these big companies involved, you don't get to that tipping point. And we're obviously uh, one of those. So yes, there is a self-interest to make these economies function. But it is also an enormous opportunity for business, obviously, if they understand this and be part of this. Not being part of it, I think, risks the very essence of your business model in the first place. Now, business has many responsibilities. I always like to quote Viktor Frankl, who wrote this book, Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl was a survivor of a Nazi uh, Germany. And um, in his book, he wrote that uh, when they built the Statue of Liberty on the east coast of the United States, they forgot to build the Statue of Responsibility on the west coast. There is no 
liberty without responsibility. So if you're a company of our size, or if you're a country like the US or others, then you need to have that responsibility to actively be part of that solution. For business, it obviously means responsibilities towards human rights, towards paying our fair tax in the places that we operate, towards being part of fighting this enormous disease of corruption that is still everywhere in many places in the world. And I think an increasing amount of businesses start to understand that. Enough, for sure not, but an increasing amount is. Business starts to understand also increasingly that not acting might actually have a higher cost than acting. I think we're actually at that point right now, that the cost of inaction is higher than the cost of action. And you see that, again, if you look at some of these numbers of climate change, but you look at food security. This is still a world where about 800 million people go to bed hungry every night, not even knowing if they wake up the next day. Which is totally unexplainable if you then at the same time realize that we're wasting 30 to 40% of the food that we're producing, as if we don't care. The food that we waste is about 80 billion, sorry, $800 billion every year. Forget the effects on climate change and all the other things, that's just a small detail that comes with it. But we're wasting $800 billion in food, whilst it actually only takes 80 billion to feed these people that go to bed hungry. Isn't that an equation that humanity should be able to solve? And yet we're unable on the G7 or the G20 to get food security on the agenda. It's in fact, as far as I'm concerned, a scandal. Now, equally there are enormous opportunities in this development agenda. Opportunities for business, for all businesses, if they really understand that. Just investing equally in this world, in women as we do in men. Access to financing, education, land rights, which unfortunately is not the case in the majority of the country still, would unlock the global economy by $28 trillion. Any $1 investment in nutrition, we still have 160 million stunted children being born every year, and it could be your child or mine. Just investing $1 gives a $17 back to society. Investing $1 in water and sanitation has a payback of $6. Any business would really love to have these returns on their investments. And yet, why don't we do that? If we have such enormous opportunities, why can we not get the world together and do this? I think the first main element that is clearly missing is trust. It's an easy word, trust. But we are running currently a society where everybody mistrusts each other. If you look at the Edelman survey, which is published every year at the time of the World Economic Forum, you will see that trust in governments is at an all-time low, trust in business, trust in CEOs even lower. And as a result of that, obviously, many people have given up. I think one of the extremes that you see this year in your political cycle in this country, which is a great amusement to all of us living abroad, and I'm glad I live abroad, um, <laughs> watching it from a distance, but it is really uh, people are fed up. They've all become against anything because the established order is clearly not attacking the issues that need to be attacked with a maturity and a sense of morality that is needed. And that is the same, by the way, in many other countries. It just get, doesn't get as much share of voice as obviously the US media does. But trust is very low and trust in business is even lower, as I said. And that's not surprising because we've seen an enormous amounts of scandals. I'm, Normally, I take the Financial Times of the day, and I can open every day a Financial Times, and there's one or another company that gets caught because they refuse to invest in safety in the wells in the Gulf, or they refuse to, refuse to invest in the safety of their workers, and the factory collapses in Bangladesh, or they manipulate LIBOR or foreign exchange rates, or they, they start to tinkle with the emission standards of their engines, and the list goes on. The list goes on. And in this age of transparency, what companies need to understand is that there isn't really any place to hide anymore. I don't think that these issues are more or less than they were before, but they are certainly more transparent than they were before. That I can tell you. So companies need to take notice of that and be sure that the way they operate is, you know, is transparent and take responsibility for that if we want to build that, that uh, trust. Uh, trust can only come from transparency. Transparency builds trust, and trust is needed to build prosperity. And any time these companies don't behave responsibly, you see over and over that about 30 to 40% of their market cap disappears. So increasingly, not surprisingly, it's interesting also to the financial market that want to know that what they are investing 
is, uh, you know, is responsible in investing. The other thing we need is obviously transparency, as I said, that goes with trust. I don't think you can build trust without that transparency. We are publishing far more data now as a company than we've ever done in the history of mankind, I believe, and we will continue to do that. Because by showing what we do, by giving access to that to many people, we can build that. The other thing that is needed is a different business model. If you want to solve all these issues like climate change or food security or poverty alleviation or access to clean drinking water or education if you want to, you cannot be victim to the quarterly reporting. This market and this world has become incredibly short term, incredibly myoptic. And many companies, unfortunately, would forego, would forego doing the right decisions long term if it affects their quarterly profits versus market guidance. We've become very myoptic. And not surprisingly, the average length of a publicly traded company in the US now has gone down to 17 years. The average tenure of a CEO is now uh, four and a half years. In that short cycle, these longer term issues that really are important for all of us are not getting the attention that they need. So you need different business models. In Unilever, when I became CEO, we stopped doing quarterly reporting. We stopped giving guidance. We moved our compensation systems to the long term. But more importantly, we developed business models that really are firmly ingrained in the, in the principle of partnerships. It was Einstein who said the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. That's not going to work anymore. We've come so far. If we now really want to snap out of this and create this better world for everybody, we have to become adults and start working at a different level as well. And that different level has to come via trust, as I mentioned, but certainly a different form of partnership as well. It's a partnership more than just you and I working together because the two of us can do more than each of us individually. It's first and foremost a partnership for the common good, where we put the interest of others ahead of our own knowing that by doing so, we will actually be better off in the longer term. If we get that higher level of partnership, of moral morality, if you want to, I think we can solve any of the world's problems. We don't need more PhDs in due respect or send missions to Mars to find the answer. For most of these issues of the development agenda, we have the answer. And frankly, increasingly we see others becoming aware of the enormous potentials or the downside of risks if we don't act. I personally would only want to invest in companies that create a better future where I can retire in or my children can live in. So we see people becoming much more conscious of how they use the power of their wallet. Millennials are the best example of that. In fact, this is the first year that the millennials in the US will have the same number of voting power as the baby boomers. Unfortunately, they're not as politically engaged because they've been turned off a little bit by what is happening. But it's the same now in 2020, which is not that far off. We have significantly more millennials as voting power. And these people are far more purpose driven. They are far more conscious of how they uh, put their dollars to use. And, and uh, hopefully will be a big wave of change that will benefit us all. But the financial evidence is also there. I personally don't believe that the thing will move at the speed that we need to move it if we don't get the financial market involved. Unfortunately, if you want to, it is still a market, a global economy that very heavily depends on that. And the interesting thing is that most of the studies now actually show that companies that are more transparent obviously take risks away from the financial market and have a lower cost of capital. It also shows that you get better operational performance. Companies that think about climate change or some of these issues also make their whole value chain more resilient. And then not surprisingly, the um, stock price performance, everything else being equal, is actually better of companies that are more responsible in this market. The... Um, what uh, Unilever has done with that Unilever Sustainable Living Plan that Jim briefly referred to is actually create a business model where we totally decouple our growth from environmental impact and increase our overall social impact. But the difference from CSR and staying in your own shop if you want to or making it only part of your company is that we fully integrate this in all we do. It is in fact our business model. And we take responsibility of the total value chain. You cannot solve issues if you just stay in your own nar narrow little box and work in silos. If in our case you're in the food business, you have to take responsibility from the farm to the fork. And all the issues that are in between, the issue of malnutrition or stunting, the issues of climate smart agriculture, the issues of food waste, the issues of creating jobs for smallholder farmers, 
the issue of deforestation, half of it driven by the enormous demand of food. And on the other hand, the issues of obesity and some of the other things we talked about. Yes, if you want to be a responsible company and you're in that business, you then also have to be co-responsible to finding solutions to these issues that show up in your total value chain. I think that um, the divestiture movement or the financial market is getting increasingly interested in this agenda. We had in Paris at the COP21, uh, $24 trillion of capital under management asking for a price on carbon. We thought in Paris that we could get the divestiture movement, you know, the carbon divestiture. You see a lot of that at universities now with your endowment funds, et cetera. We thought we could get to 100 billion. We actually got 900 billion at the time of Paris, and that number has gone up to 2.7 trillion now. So the financial market is catching on. And you can see that. 57 companies in the, UK, in the US have gone bankrupt that were in the coal business. Peabody, the last one, just in the last two years alone. You can see it in other things. Tesla makes actually relatively few cars. The Model 3, tremendously popular, 325,000 orders for that car in the first few days alone. Despite selling less than one, one twentieth or one thirtieth of the cars of General Motors, it has, it has already half the market cap of General Motors. Increasingly, the financial community is, feeding, is, is voting with their wallets, and they're getting actively involved as they see this as an enormous uh, risk, but also an enormous opportunity. Investment in green energy right now is far exceeding the investment in fossil fuel, even with the low prices, in fact, that we have. Now, let me pick up pace and do only one or two more things before we open it up to Q&As. I think the first one is the millennials, because there are many millennials in, in the audience. And I would just say that a purpose-driven business model makes a lot more sense. Only 30% of millennials actually want to work for corporates. They just don't feel it's cool anymore to work for corporates for the reasons that we mentioned. Since we moved to this much more stronger purpose-driven business model, we actually find ourselves to be the third most looked up company in LinkedIn after Google and Apple. Not even being a, a product name, Unilever is sort of the holding name and our, all of our products have different names. We get 1.8 million people applying to our company every year. And in most countries that we operate, we're the preferred employers. So even from that point of view, it would make sense to be able to attract the best and brightest would certainly guarantee a future of your company. What we also see clearly is that millennials don't want to just be part of this. They very much understand that the next 15 years are going to be crucial for them. They want to be an active part in shaping this future. I had the pleasure to be serving on the high-level panel to develop these sustainable development goals for the Secretary General. And we put this website out there, The World We Want. And within a nanosecond, we had over a million young people, many from Africa, writing down what they want. They want to be actively involved in shaping this agenda. And too often, we still exclude this young generation. Next to the millennials, we also obviously need a different type of leadership. I was very excited to hear that here at Stanford, you're actually trying to put this curriculum together for future leaders and that you have a uh, first one coming on with the young global leaders from the World Economic Forum. That's a very exciting step you're taking there. But it is very clear that the leaders of tomorrow need to be purpose-driven, need to be able to work in partnership, need to feel comfortable with that level of transparency, need to be systemic thinkers to be able to handle this complexity, but above all need to be human beings. Human beings with a high level of awareness and engagement and a certain level of humanity and humility. If we get more of these leaders, and we're clearly short of it now, looking at the average tenure of a CEO, but if we get more of these leaders, I think that we're on the right path to uh, solve some of these uh, key issues that we have. So in conclusion, I think we, are, uh, we should not feel despair. I think we're moving in the right direction, but uh, the challenge is obviously how fast we move, because the longer we wait, the more difficult the challenge will be or the more expensive it will be. But for me, the reason to move fast is the longer we wait, the more people will live in poverty. And there is no excuse that we let that happen. I've always felt that if you belong to the 2% of the world population that can do and like what they want, go to wonderful institutions like this, find the jobs they like or work, not, don't have to worry about their child not making the age of five or being stunted or being included in the workforce and all the other things. If you belong to those 2%, then it's obviously your oblig obligation to work for the other 98%. And that is what we're trying to do 
in uh, Unilever. It was Martin Luther King that actually said that uh, everyone can be great because everyone can serve. And all of us in our own humble ways can make that difference to together create a better world for all and certainly for generations to come. And that's obviously the world I want to live in and I want to be part of that challenge to say this is what we really did in the coming 15 years so that nobody else has to worry about these challenges. I like the Dalai Lama. Uh, one of the things the Dalai Lama said that um, if you seek enlightenment um, for yourself simply to enhance yourself and your position, you miss purpose. But if you seek enlightenment for yourself to enable you to serve others, you are with purpose. So my message to you very simply is go with purpose. Thank you very much. Well, Paul, thank you so much for those inspiring words. Um, I think we're, you've left us with many things to think about. But there were some exciting things you said. There are signs that governments, companies, people in general are not only more aware, but are taking action um, to do something about the development agenda, about sustainability. But that was not really the case a few years back when you took over Unilever as CEO. And you came in the first day and made huge changes. But how did you handle all the challenges and the resistance that came with that? Well, so I had, um, there were changes indeed, but first of all, there was a burning platform. And in fact, I had two of them. Uh, I came in uh, from the outside, which helped a little bit by not being so biased toward some of the changes that needed to be made perhaps. But um, uh, the business was not doing so well, so that was a burning platform. And then you had the crisis in uh, 2007, 2008. Uh, so it wasn't difficult to convince people that we needed to do things differently. Because I came in from the outside, and actually I had worked what some people thought was, uh, was competition in the past. I don't have that concept myself, but um, uh, they, some people felt that the Trojan horse was led into the company. And I discovered uh, very early on that it was for me to prove that I could be part of the team instead of them to prove that they could be part of my team. And I had to establish myself. So I spent an enormous amount of time uh, digging into the history of the company. Uh, Jim Collins in his book, From Good to Great, talks about uh, nurturing the core before you stimulate progress. And we actually went back to the roots of this company. We actually went to Port Sunlight, which is in the, in the north of England, uh, where the company had started. The, symbolically had a meeting there with our senior management and discussed a little bit what had made this company great. And we came to some enormous values. And one of them is certainly doing well by doing good. This was a man, by the way, that instituted in the UK the uh, six, hour, uh, six hour a day, uh, which was very revolutionary in the 1800s, I can tell you. When he became a lord and he went into parliament, he introduced the pension plans. Uh, he was all, when, when his employees would go to war, uh, and volunteer for the wars that were there, the World War I and World War II, he obviously dealt only with World War I, but uh, guaranteed the wages to the wives uh, so that they could live. And so he was an extraordinary man in that sense but always of the belief of doing well by doing good, founding the marine stewardship of sustainable fishery or the round table of sustainable development. So what we did is we took all that strength and said, can we not turn that into a business model that is desperately needed right now, where we link all of this and see this as an increasingly uh, 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 powerful driver for future business growth. And what uh, the surprise in all of this, it's hard work. It's not that easy, obviously. And some people are always skeptical, but you need them to make better plans. But um, uh, people rally quite quickly towards something when it is a higher purpose and want to be part of that. So people want to make a difference. They want to leave this world in a little bit better place. They want to touch people positively. And if you can work for a company that, where those values can come alive, uh, then people feel happier. and. We've seen that in our engagement scores, which were sort of in the bottom tercile when we started, and now they're off the map uh, because people want to be part of this. On that note, can you tell us 
When did you find purpose in promoting sustainability as a business practice? Well, it was always, uh, the question is always, why didn't our predecessors deal with this as much as they should have? And the, the answer is really, there wasn't, the issue wasn't so evident. Uh, because we've lifted so many people out of poverty, we really got the issues of planetary boundaries. If you go back even at the time that the original Millennial Development Goals were, were developed, the word sustainable didn't show up there even. There were issues of HIV, there were issues in the developing markets. Now many of these issues have become global because of our interdependent world. So it's only in the last 10 years, I think, that people have become fully aware of what needed to be changed. And that's why you see this momentum now. Um, but I, I would not um, worry about that. What we have to now do is just to be sure that we can accelerate. Because as usual, there's always a little bit of festered order that doesn't like to change. If you're on the right side of the equation, in this transformation of this global economy, you are more likely to be resistant than if you are not getting the benefits from the global economy. But the reality right now is that about 99% of the people are not getting the benefits of the global economy anymore. So I hope we can build this momentum and accelerate that to make the changes. By the way, nothing to do with being Democrat or Republican or being a Dutchman, often accused of smoking pot and all the other things, <laughs> which is liberalized in our country. It just has to do with a a common sense agenda to make this world work for all of us long term. If you see the cost that Europe now has on refugees, for example, is enormous. And then if you see the money that we spent is a pittance to actually solve these issues. So it's becoming increasingly transparent, I think, that this is an agenda for humanity. The way you you frame things, to me it sounds like today there's also momentum and today we are still at an inflection point companies could use to change business practices. And yet you don't see, you know, those that do stand out because not many are doing it. How yeah, and that's that? a good question. That's a good question. But you, I, I start from the premise that I believe in the goodness of people because I never met a CEO who wants more unemployment or more climate change or more pollution uh, unless they don't tell me. But, but I don't think they're there, really. So you have to believe in the goodness of all of us. And then you have to ask yourself the question, well, if that is the case, why doesn't it happen? And there are obviously many reasons for that. The global economy isn't functioning, so you have to work very hard to even keep your own company afloat. These issues of tenure that you might not have the skill set. So there are many of those reasons. But I think, in essence, it boils down to the behavior of people is, is uh, governed by the boundaries in which you operate. And that is true for all of us. Uh, if you become a father or a mother and you have children, you, you start to get different boundaries and you have different behaviors. You might not go out to the bar every night anymore with your buddies. You might want to do a little bit more babysitting or sit together with your kids. If I tell a salesman that he gets rewarded on the number of orders he writes, sales orders, he's going to split many orders and writes a lot of orders. If I tell him he's going to be rewarded on the total sales volume he brings in, he might have a different behavior. And there are three main things in this world that drive people's behavior in a dysfunctional way. The first one is the short-termism versus long-term. So we have to move the market to the longer term. Larry Fink, who runs BlackRock, one of the biggest institutions, has written about that because everybody sees this destructiveness of that. The second thing is this balance between man and nature. We have put the boundaries wrong. If you, if you can, again, not that I want to be religious here, but if you go to the book of Genesis, it says man's dominance over nature. And we have started to interpret that as that we can literally dominate nature and destroy nature, that we are smarter. But our intelligence was meant to be to be stewards of nature. So we have to give nature a value in all we do. And we need to move the narrow definition of GDP or the profit and loss statement in the company to more integrated reporting, including the environmental and social uh, capital next to the financial capital. Capitalists are very good at optimizing capital, but we've only put them on a path to optimize financial capital. But if we put a price on carbon, for example, we would move much faster in bringing climate change down. Just like you put a price on water, we bring water usage down. So move to environmental and, and social accounting next to financial is absolutely a must. And then the third element of the boundaries is really our financial system. Our financial system's rewards are all uh, on uh, capital and unfortunately not on labor because they were designed at a different time. But we have been slow in evolving it. One of the reasons that we've been slow of evolving it is that most of the institutions that we have created at the time of Bretton Woods, which was uh, 
long time ago for you in the 40s, but it was um, when 90% or 85% of the world economy was in Europe and the US. Now we have a global economy and we haven't figured out yet how to, and it's very interdependent, and we haven't figured out yet how to create the institutions to rule it. And we need to move to a system where we don't reward capital. You take this country, I was in New York on Monday or Tuesday, a few hedge fund guys, and I'm not against them, but a few hedge fund guys last year together made 10 billion. Their tax rate probably is 10%. Then they give 25 million to charity to help the homeless in New York. They're heroes, they're all of a sudden, um, you know, um, philanthropists of the highest order. They probably used the 25 million also to offset their tax bill on the 10%. And, but they created the problem in the first place because our system rewards the capital uh, at no tax and the people that work and labor often gets 40, 50% tax. At a time that we need to create more jobs, we need to actually subsidize labor and penalize capital because we have enough of the capital. We don't need to get higher returns. Now, I think that's a very radical thought for some people in the US, but it's absolutely needed if we want to change the global economy. After that answer, I have so many questions about what you think of tax systems, <laughs> supply chains, uh, governments, world thought leaders. But I'm going to take a pause right now and allow the audience to make a question. There's going to be a microphone over here. And do we have a microphone in the back as well? OK. So we have a question right here. If you can just stand just up, say your name, and um, Ask one question, please. Thank you for, uh, thank you for an inspiring talk. Uh, you talked about uh, supply chain, sustainable supply chains, and the role of CEOs in that. Can you talk about sustainable consumption? So how do we move people away from, let's say, buying more cars? Uh, yeah. We are looking at uh, penetration of electric cars right, right now in the market. But have you thought about uh, where, 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 where are we going to dispose the batteries in the next 30, 40 years? So. So one of the things that people are starting to think about, obviously, is to move from this linear economy that I briefly referred to to this circular economy. Right now, we're basically digging it out of the ground, producing, and then dumping it again. And if we keep digging, you know, you end up in Australia, and there's not much left. And that's really what we are doing. So how can you be sure that someone else's waste is someone else's input, so that nothing goes to waste? So in Unilever, we, for example, said we want to run all of our 500-plus factories that we have at zero waste. We actually achieved that two years ahead of target by thinking about it differently. Our costs go down, the pride goes up, quality goes up actually, customer service goes up, a lot of benefits from doing that. So the circular economy concept thinks about moving into that direction. Now it's very exciting with millennials actually. They are not as possessive as we were. They really are growing up in a sharing economy. Uh, Ubers, Airbnbs are the example of that. But increasingly they feel very comfortable by paying for experiences, but not paying for physical goods. So that goes into the right direction. But having said that, it needs obviously much more. So in Europe now, there's a directive on circular economy coming in. Many countries in the world don't have waste recycling systems yet. And it's difficult for countries to do or start sometimes. But if you have a country like India or Brazil or China not having waste recycling, then Houston, we have a problem. So we've put the global consumer goods uh, industry, for example, together to because no company can do it alone to move into some of that, uh, you know, in, in targeting country by country, for example, to move uh, to recycling systems or other things. And at the end of the day, we need to, which is very hard for companies to understand, we need to stimulate consumers to use less. And people might say, why would you advocate that as a company? Because there is a big difference between using less material and creating more value. I can create far more value with less material, and, but you have to think about that. So, um, so we look at all of our products, for example, do compactions, do light weighting on plastics. Be sure that actually the products leave from what's in the bottle because in many products, 15, 20% stays in the bottle when you throw it away. And as we do all these things, you actually get higher customer satisfaction, create other relationships with consumers you can build value of. So you have to indeed think about a growth model without using more stuff, but creating more value in its broadest sense. And those models are actually very successful. You take food and food in the US. Food in the US has always been driven by calories. You would go to one of these pizza places. I, I mean, I'm victim of it myself with my three boys. I could go to Pizza Hut and 
I, as a European, I could never understand it because I brought in two or three coupons and I would leave with money and five pizzas. And <laughs> you know, so I never understood how this system worked, but this was you know, the American dream, I guess. Um, so, uh, but it was all based on calories and it was the lower the better, the more we could get calories. And that gave a certain level of happiness, I guess. Now you see in the food industry in the US, it's rapidly moving to nutrition, where people are willing to pay more for less, actually. I would go to a restaurant where I get half a plate, I would actually pay more. So that I don't have to you know, see all that stuff I can't eat anyway, or feel very bad that it's thrown away afterwards. I actually pay more for it now. And I think that's happening in the global economy in total. So that notion of that little bit more purpose-driven and, and more conscious sharing is creeping in. So Paul, in these last two minutes that we have with you, could you share some advice? Most of us here are MBA students looking to go back into for-profit organizations and will probably not be the CEO right off the start, so... You might. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, what can we do to bring sustainable practices into the organizations we go into? Yeah, first of all, don't have an ambition to become a CEO. That is a stupid ambition. Uh, I always tell people, not because I don't like my job, but it's just that anybody can have that title. Uh, the most important thing is that you pursue your, your purpose. Uh, whatever you feel strong about. Uh, if you figure out what, where you want to make the difference, that's the first thing you need to do. And some might fight for women's rights, some might want to fight for people in emerging markets, some might want to include better education, but you need to have something that you want to have an impact in this world. And that has to align with your values. If that aligns with your values, you are going to be successful because it will drive your passion. It doesn't matter uh, you know, the, the, the money you earn is not an indicator of success anymore. You know, people's self-worth should not be measured by people's net worth. It's very important if you want to have a good life. And then the, sec the third thing is obviously um, um, a positive attitude is equally important because the things never go the way you want it to go. Uh, otherwise, someone else would have done it before you. So the road to change is a road that has many skeptics or cynics, rejections, but if you are strongly driven by your purpose and your values, I think, and the stronger they are, the better beacon you have in, an, in a very volatile environment to deal with these challenges. You, you stay guided, as someone once said, by the lights of the stars, not by the lights of the passing ships. And at the end of the day, you need to do what you really feel you can make the biggest difference if you're in a, in a fortunate position like ours. I, I don't say it on camera, but I, the reason I work in this company and give my energy to that is because I can have a bigger impact in doing what I do now than I can see in any other opportunity that is offered to me. And if that is a possibility to have a bigger impact to uh, change the world uh, for the better, then that's my duty to do that until someone else can do it better than I do. And the, f and the final point I just want to leave you is, is um, the importance of um, a positive attitude is, uh, reminds me of a story that my father always told me of the uh, boiling water with the carrot, the egg, and the coffee bean. And the egg is actually very soft, but it goes into the boiling water and becomes very hard and stubborn. You can't do anything with it. The carrot was actually strong, went into the boiling water, but became very soft and mushy. But the coffee bean went into the water and changed the color of the water around it but, but stay at the coffee bean. So my message to all of you is just be the coffee bean in life. Thank you very much. Everyone, a big round of applause for Paul Coleman, please.